fourth Green Hotel, uh, the fourth webinar in the Green Hotel webinar series. Uh, I'm Dan Rubin. I'm the executive director of Boston Green Tourism. Um, and we are an organization of 30 or so greater Boston hotels that are improving our environmental performance. Um, I also organize webinars like this and workshops and uh, I uh, consult with hotels on going green. And my screen is not advancing. I'm not sure why. Bottom left. I'm sorry. Bottom Here left. we go. Okay, so the objective of our, uh, for those of you that haven't been here before, the, the objectives of this webinar series is to help hotels reduce energy, water, waste, and toxins, and to use that information if you're interested in becoming green certified. Uh, this is the fourth of six webinars. We have two upcoming uh, in May, uh, so I encourage you to register for them. Uh, I, as a part of this Environmental Protection Agency grant, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one training sessions with up to 10 hotels or hotel groups, and I still have four slots left, so contact me if you're interested. Um, just a word about our two upcoming sessions, May 7th, a week from today. We have speakers on how hotels reduce their natural gas bills, uh, a, a green hotel case study from the Holiday Inn and Suites Columbia Airport in South Carolina, and sustainable bottled water. And then on May 21st, uh, we'll, we have the topics of <clears throat> waste management for hotels, green cleaning for hotels, and LED lighting for hotels. Uh, this session today, uh, Jim Shively from Schneider Electric is going to talk about energy management systems for guest rooms and function rooms. What's the latest? Uh, what do, what do uh, all uh, hotels from inns to large uh, hotels need to know about energy management systems? Uh, Scott Hopps is then going to talk about green procurement for hotels. Uh, and then Abby McAllister from the Sabre Point Inn and Spa is going to give us a case study of the wonderfully green Sabre Point Inn and Spa. Um, if you, um, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A. Um, send us your questions during this session. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can. If we can't get to them all, we'll send you answers individually. Um, these, uh, the presentations today and, and from the past sessions will eventually be posted and I'll, I will notify everybody who registered for at least one event once they're posted. Um, here's my contact information. Um, George, I would like to uh, now turn this over to Jim Shively and uh, could you turn over my screen? Small side. Okay, and let me um, let me just introduce Jim. Jim uh, Jim is from Schneider Electric. Schneider um, is a global energy management company founded in the early 1800s and now has over 145,000 employees in over 100 in over 100 countries. In the U.S. alone, Schneider has 30, 300 field offices. 250 partner companies, and is the parent company of brands such as Square D, Palco Security Cameras, uh, Tech Building Automation, and more. Uh, Jim Shively owned a national infrared inspection company and has been in the hospitality industry for over 25 years. He was brought on board four years ago with Schneider Electric to head up the hospitality business development for the in-room control segment for North America. Uh, Jim, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dan, for the introduction, and welcome to everybody to the uh, In-Room Energy Management System webinar, and good afternoon. Um, uh, management system and how that would, what it is, and how it would uh, affect and improve your, your energy and uh, other solutions there. So what is an in-room energy management system? It's a wired or wireless occupancy-based control system that regulates the individual guest room temperature while the room is either unrented or unoccupied to reduce energy consumption by an average of 17 to 22 percent. That was 17 to 22 percent was taken by a one-year-long study by the Northwest Pacific National Labs 
up out of Seattle, Washington. It was uh, finished uh, about September 2012, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the results of that later on in the presentation. So why install an energy management system? One and foremost, it saves energy without guest involvement. So you don't have to worry about the guest putting in different uh, uh, key cards, different things like this. Uh, most energy management systems are automated, and it's kind of behind the scenes, out of sight, out of mind, with the guest not realizing the energy saving that's going on when they're out of the room. It adds value to the customer experience. And how, how does that, uh, how's that happen there with the customer experience? Well, one, it determines adverse conditions prior to a guest complaint. So if you have a fully network installed, and we'll talk about different types, you can actually get alarms and, and remotes, remote alarms uh, alerting you to different conditions within the room itself before the actual guest actually uh, determines that themselves. The other thing you can do is remotely and quickly address guest HVAC and lighting issues uh, via a network system. And also, the third thing is predict predictive maintenance. So you're able to determine runtime, HVAC runtime conditions. You can determine if the, the air filters are clogged or uh, if there are any type of preventive maintenance that needs to be done in your rooms and your HVAC systems. Also, you can determine the inefficiency or efficiency of the room condition itself due to possible thermal loadings on the exterior. Typical control devices for uh, energy management system. I'll just look at a couple of them here. One is in, in the center part is, is really a smart thermostat. Um, it has onboard logic. It has uh, usually a Zigbee control, uh, uh, Zigbee uh, communication module in it. Uh, that's, a, that's a protocol that, they, that typical in-room energy management systems uses for communication to other devices. So the thermostat's your main brains behind the, the uh, control system. And then you have what they call children devices. The children devices are m made up of the contact, door contact itself, as you can see there, or, or a separate motion sensor. And you can also add in children devices as lighting switches. All of this can be either a standalone, which I'll explain, or a network system, which adds in the four group coordinator. So these are the different types of energy management options. Option one is really just a motion only, where you have the smart thermostat and you have a motion sensor. That motion sensor can either be a separate motion sensor, which can be installed somewhere within the room, typically over the bed area so that it, it uh, detects guest movement, or it can be embedded in the actual thermostat or controller itself, as you see on the bottom picture there of the, uh, of the square rectangular uh, thermostat with the embedded motion sensor on the bottom. Option two is you add in additional door contact. In this way, you have logic between the door contact and motion. And that door logic uh, motion uh, is, is better than just the motion only because it actually detects the, the door opening. And then it looks for motion to determine if there's occupancy in that room or not. So that's an option two. And then option three is really tying this whole thing into a network solution, which ties goes back through the uh, backbone of the internet I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the hotel structure, and then ties it into the pro property management system, and then also has uh, remote access to that room with monitoring and, and reporting capabilities. And, and typically in a network system, you have what they call Zigbee mesh network, and you will have a, a group coordinator within the, the uh, IT closet. Those are all your wireless communications throughout the whole entire hotel. So wirelessly, all these thermostats are working together in what they call mesh network. So they, they actually are, are communicating between the thermostats back to the group coordinator. So you got typical uh, room area network, as you can see up in the left, upper left, uh, which consists of the smart thermostat with its children devices. Also, they can, can uh, be tied into a set-top box, so you have capability of doing uh, HVAC and lighting through your TV remote control. Uh, the hotel area network, again, it's, it's tied into a group coordinator. That's also tied into the different uh, systems, including your PMS, uh, off-site, on-site servers, remote, remote uh, monitoring, and, and uh, on-site monitoring. So those are your two types of systems. You have a standalone energy management system, and you also have a fully networked energy management system. So just to give you an idea how the operations of this works, real simply, you have a fully networked system. You have a PMS server. It's going to send a signal down to uh, EMS server. 
that's going to uh, determine and allow the guest to uh, uh, allow the smart thermostat to understand the guest has just checked in, and the room status will go uh, from a unrented to a rented status, and it will actually create a setback, and it will come out of a deep setback. But once the guest actually physically walks through that door and enters the room, the door contact then sends a signal along with the motion sensor saying, hey, my room, room's occupied, take the complete uh, setback off and go back into a normal operating status. And the room is then controlled completely by the guest. So the guest has full control of the thermostat. The guest leaves the room, door contact motion again senses over to the smart thermostat. And at that time, it says, hey, I don't have anybody in the room. It changes the room status from a rented occupied to a unrented occupied status. And when that happens in an unrented occupied status, then as the motion sensors continue to sense, it goes into unoccupied status and allows the thermostat to be set back in what they call setback mode. So you're saving energy when the guest is out of the room but actually rented the, rented the room. So it's unoccupied rented. The other thing is when the guest actually leaves and checks out, now you get a signal that says, hey, from the PMS server to the server, sends up to the smart thermostat and says, hey, my room status has changed from a rented unoccupied to an unrented unoccupied, and it goes back into a deep setback, so it's saving further energy while your room is unoccupied and unrented. So just a real quick on the, how that works is you can take a default setting, you can then apply an upper level, uh, upper limit and lower limit set points. You can apply that deep setback, which is a band across the deep set, set point, uh, across the default set point, which then allows the temperature to flow up and down, typically a six degree up and down float. And then you also, when it's un, when it rented and unoccupied, that set band or dead band becomes smaller, usually a three degree setback float of six degrees. But what happens is when it's rented and occupied, those setbacks are completely removed and now the, the guest has full, walk, full control of that thermostat up and down, up to the upper limit and down to the lower limit. Uh, if you have a sliding glass door, you have that capability, you can actually have the, th the uh, control actually shut itself down when the sliding glass door is opened. And also, this is important, this is called a floating setback. So when the guest leaves and, there's a, and he leaves it at 69 degrees, Typically what you should see in an energy management solution is the dead band is applied across that last set point and allows it to flow only up and down uh, past the uh, up and down um, over the last set point, not to a predetermined set point because if you had the guest leave at 69 degrees and your predetermined set point was 75, your guest is going to come back in and feel the difference. This way it's called a floating set point and it only goes across the last set point of the, of the guest leaving. And then when it's unoccupied, and unrented, it goes back to a default setting and applied a, a deep, deep setback. Typically, you have in a network system, you have a, a software uh, program that can look at the different floor levels, can tell what the status of the, of the room is, if it's unoccupied and rented, if it's unrented and occupied, different statuses of the room, which you make up by different colors. Typically, you can do individual room set points. You can control a room uh, remotely using uh, the software. And then also, you can look at uh, event types. You can see when someone walked in, when the motion went off, when, it came, when the door was open. Um, you can look at performance graphs and charts. You can look at different things as far as the efficiency of their rooms. And then typically, you can uh, look at time uh, over uh, uh, performance over time along with with uh, different uh, pie charts. You have uh, dashboards and schedulers. You can pretty much schedule uh, events to happen. If you have a global event, you want to change all your set points at a certain time of the year, you can do that and set that up also. Um, typically, you can do a global setting on one or entire room. You can look at different customized spreadsheets, graphs, and charts. You can look at run times. You can see if your run time of one particular room is, is running 90-some uh, percent, you might have a hot water st valve stuck, or you might have air, cl air filters clogged if they're running more than 50% of the time. So you can use this as a tool to evaluate your condition of your HVAC systems and also look at uh, setting up preventive maintenance and scheduling that. Um, you can have uh, battery runtime status reports of the actual children devices. You can look at communication status and have that sent out as, as an email 
predetermined alarm set points. And then this is the report from the U.S. Department of Energy I talked to you about in the beginning. Uh, this was a guest room HVAC occupancy based control technology uh, was reported. It's a public publication September of 2012. Um, in that report is a summary of the results. As you can see in Table One, the average average energy savings percent went from 10 percent all the way up to 26.5 percent. So there was a variance in average percent uh, percent savings. Uh, this was a, a study that was done across uh, three geographical areas of the United States. So you can see there there's difference uh, in savings. The result was the average savings of the entire study over the one year was about 18.4 percent energy savings. With this uh, study, the typical return on investment based on the study was between 2.5 and 5.5 years. So why an EMS solution? Basically guest satisfaction, uh, user-friendly smart thermostat. You can control upper limits and lower limits. You can uh, have a, uh, a default settings. You can minimize inadvertent setbacks. You can use door entry, sent, uh, uh, door entry welcome scenes on lighting. And, uh, and the solution is invisible to the guest. Operational-wise, we talked about that. You can have different software capability of doing remotely, uh, adjusting temperatures for your guest. You can also uh, have uh, engineering be proactive and efficient. You can run runtime reports. You can also have your system be expandable, upgradable, integratable, and scalable. So those are different things that are advantages of an EMS system. So my contact information there uh, is, again, I'm Jim Shively, Director of Business Development at Snyder Electric. There's a mobile number and also my email address. Well, thank you, Jim. Are there any questions uh, that, that have come in? Yes, Dan. We have a couple questions that have shown up. Uh, one of them asks, can you install a standalone system and then eventually install the network to connect the PMS? Uh, yes, that's exactly. Typically how an EMS system works is you can go to a standalone system and it'll be, it'll be upgradable to a network system. And really what you're doing is you're just adding in the, the uh, wireless group controller or some type of uh, uh, controller in the IT closet that will then Zigbee, Zigbee mesh, Z, mesh network, Zigbee, Zigbee protocol wise all the thermostats together. That becomes the network and then that network itself then will be tying into the PMS and also giving you a front end software type uh, reporting capability and control capability. So if you want to look at just starting out with an EMS solution and be as far as a budget and you're looking at a, at a, a system, what you want, really want to do is you want to look at the, the EMS systems out there that allow you to be scalable and, and upgrade that to the next solution because you might be putting in your system as a standalone, taking your energy savings and the money you're saving through that standalone system and then you can apply it to uh, your budget for upgrading it to a network. Absolutely. Great, Jim. Here's another one. Um, does the type of uh, HVAC system matter and are PTAC units excluded? Good question. PTAC uh, units are not excluded. Uh, EMS systems usually can control, uh, depending on the manufacturer, there's an actual uh, control board in the PTAC that allows that to go out to a smart thermostat and tie that in and you can control that either wirelessly, wirelessly or wired back to the PTEC. Typically it's a wired system going back to the PTEC to the smart thermostat, but PTECs can be controlled. So the type of system, fan coil unit, uh, PTEC, uh, vertical units, that really doesn't matter. Anything that's controlled by a thermostat uh, can be replaced with a smart thermostat and controlled through an EMS manager system. Uh, typically if your PTEC has the old style turn knob controls, um, you might have to add in a board that will allow ex uh, external access to the thermostats and, and tie that back in wirelessly. Okay, and uh, our last question is similarly has to do with uh, the, the question, uh, can you use current smart thermostats or do you need to replace those thermostats? 
You know, the, 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 let's talk about the technology upgrade in the last five years. If you had an old smart thermostat in there, uh, the technology has advanced so much uh, where um, you're able to, uh, well, let's go back to the question. Can you use an old one or do you have to replace it? Yes, you probably have to replace it because of the, the protocol um, is probably not the same communication protocol as today. They're using a Zigbee Pro 1.1 protocol typically in an EMS manager system, which is an open protocol, which allows other children devices to be installed. So you can go every, anything from your motion, separate motion, separate door. You can add in plug load uh, controls where you're controlling uh, maybe your TV or your lamps or you're tying in other stuff. So really the protocol determines if you have to replace it or not, but typically, yes, that you would have to replace it. Okay, Jim, Jim thanks. Uh, for I, I, have, I have a question for you. Um, some of the people on the call are from inns and, and small, uh, very small facilities. Are these systems for them too? Yeah, good question, Dan. So, so yes, you could use a very, uh, basic um, uh, thermostat with an onboard motion sensor. So you have a, a thermostat with an uh, uh, embedded motion. And that would be great for a smaller hotel where you have typically a small standard room. You could put the thermostat uh, somewhere in the entry area as the, as the guest walks in. Um, that guest is going to be picked up by the onboard motion sensor on that thermostat and then be able to control that, those, those uh, temperatures and, and the, uh, regulate the, the energy savings by having that onboard motion sensor with the smart thermostat. And that, that is a very simplistic cost-effective way to control energy within a small hotel. Okay. And even a 20-room in? A absolutely. Every 20 rooms are going to cost you some money to, to, to uh, light it and heat it. Okay, good. Um, well, great. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, let's, uh, George, if you could uh, turn the controls over to Scott Hops. Uh, Scott Hops is a 13-year hospitality professional with a strong operational background. He is the Director of Sustainability for the Saunders Hotel Group, where he has implemented projects across the portfolio from large to small. Uh, he's implemented cogeneration, advanced lighting and controls, large mechanical upgrades, to name a few. Throughout Scott's tenure, he has worked to infuse a new way of thinking, including moving away from business as usual to sustainably minded purchasing. Uh, Scott is going to talk to us about how to develop a great green procurement program for your hotel. Uh, Scott, take it away. Great. Thanks. Um, everyone see my screen now? Mm -hmm. I'll assume yes. that's a resounding yes. All right. Uh, so let me give you a quick 30-second background on Saunders Hotel Group. We are a fourth-generation family business, owner-operator of hotels. Uh, we've had a variety, select service, luxury. We're developing a 33-story uh, tower, Lead Gold, in downtown Boston. And uh, the Lenox Hotel, which is our full-service luxury property in Boston right now, was just named one of the top ten rated green hotels by TripAdvisor. And as Dan mentioned, uh, my background is mostly operations, and I took a deep dive into all things sustainability about five years ago. And so um, my approach is very pragmatic, or at least I hope so. Um, so a quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm, I'm not planning on talking about specific products. I'm not going to give you the greenest toilet paper that also happens to be the softest, has the most sheets per roll, and miraculously whitens your teeth. Um, what I do want to offer is some insights that we've learned from decades of trial and error. And I'll give you some examples from our own sustainable purchasing policy and do my best to appeal to procurement across various industries and various geographies. But one thing that I want to um, really get across, really stress, is that buying responsibly has great opportunity. This is not a um, way to restrict your options or limit what you can give to your guests or your customers. I really think this is an exciting opportunity that you can take advantage of. Um, so you'll see the four key elements. I'm going to run through each of those. 
Um, the first one being just defining what sustainability means to you and your business. Now, you know, I'm adamant that it needs to fit in with the reality of your business. And the definition for you is going to differ um, depending on who you are, where you are, and what your impacts are um, environmentally and in the community. So for instance, a, a five-star dining experience, they're going to have different parameters and, and think about sustainability differently and have different opportunities than a, a Motel 6 does. But um, you know, hopefully what I'm going to bring up will apply to both. And it's got to be right for your business and for your customers. Um, the, the little uh, red box or the red box down at the bottom is just a, um, a snip from the, the first page of our sustainable purchasing policy, just trying to be succinct and direct about um, you know, what, what sustainability means to us. And while you're coming up with this definition and when you're coming up with the impacts and opportunities, it's important to know that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are a ton of resources out there available to you, um, different certifications. So on the, uh, the right of this slide, you know, the, the green seals, uh, fair trade, different, um, different uh, agencies that you can look to to inform your decision. Uh, on the left, I borrowed a slide from MindClick Global, who um, reached, you know, reached out to GRI and LEED and ISO in terms of informing their platform and their, their, their company that would uh, take a lot of this burden off of you, uh, cradle to cradle. Um, what I did, uh, so down in the lower right hand corner is more of what we took initially as our approach to communicating sustainable purchasing. Uh, we took LEED, EBOM, um, coming from the EPA and put that language into our purchasing policy. That specifically doesn't work. I can't get any hotel manager to read that paragraph and have any idea of what they're supposed to do. So going back to what I said earlier, just that definition needs to be right for the people that are going to use it, and it's got to be something that they understand. So our approach has been uh, to digest a lot of that uh, information and the different tools that are in place and and really try and make make it clear and at a glance and so you'll see you know icons just trying to to really simplify if I'm uh, the, the housekeeping manager I know what is um, preferred based on this sustainable purchasing policy and the other thing that we tried to do as we, as we developed ours is we tried to look for opportunities to um, use tools already in place. So if we know that uh, we're purchasing our, our, our paper and um, printer toner and other things from Office Depot, what tools are already in place that we can leverage and communicate so that it's, it's you know, put on this slide, comfortable, so that the purchasing manager isn't making a radical shift, but they're taking concrete steps to improving the things they're buying this month over last month, this year over last year. And now, defining your goals, I think, certainly goes hand in hand with defining sustainability for your operation. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, you know, if you if you try to get to uh, micromanage the process too much and define the process, you really limit the opportunities that will come about. Um, I really want to think about how you build in flexibility and uh, create this in a way that even if the person that is gung ho on uh, the environment, gung ho on green, gung ho on sustainability, even if that person's not there, that the person making the purchasing decisions is still um, is still aligned in the right direction and still aiming for the same end result. And so for example, um, you know, we want to put solar on our roof. That's not a goal. That's a means to an end. That can be a means to reducing your carbon footprint or a means to becoming more self-sufficient from an energy standpoint but that's not going to be a 
uh, one size fits all approach. I, I think if you set the goal of reducing your environmental impact, reducing your emissions, or um, becoming, you know, you know, removing yourself from the grid, you let the actors, you let the managers, the people that are dealing with it day in and day out, find their own way to that to a solution. And who knows? Maybe it's fuel cells. Maybe it's biofuels. Maybe there are a lot of efficiencies that you need to um, improve beforehand. And what I've really noticed is when we've stepped back and acted as a, a resource, uh, and when I say we internally, we have a, a team that looks at all things sustainability. Um, and it's easy to try to uh, prescribe what exactly should be done. But we've gotten better results by stepping back and being a resource and letting the managers um, see the goal, act, and um, come up with solutions that are right for the timing of their business, right for the, the needs of their uh, department. And you know, one other element of defining your goals is also uh, knowing how you're going to measure success. How are you going to track and, and um, quantify your, your progress? And in all honesty, this is one of the areas that we're still um, still struggling to accomplish. It's a, it's a moving target. There's a lot of different pieces, whether it's you know, the type of seafood we're getting or you know, a new PTAC unit for our guest room. So you know, in part, I mean, there are opportunities, and we're looking at um, partnerships with companies like uh, MindClick, who I mentioned earlier, where maybe they could take a lot of that tracking and accountability off our plate so that we use a platform and we know how we're doing uh, relative to our goals. Um, in terms of communicating those goals, uh, there's a couple of ways here. I mean, the icons along the, the left-hand side of just, again, at a glance, very easily digestible, something that uh, will draw the eye and you know, I mean, we can have the best information on the planet all condensed into one document, but if nobody looks at it, then it's worthless. And so I, I really want to make um, and have uh, taken big strides to make our purchasing policy approachable and usable and functional. Um, and just one uh, one other example, the reason for the, the little race cars, um, in terms of setting the goal and not setting the process, we were purchasing a new shuttle vehicle for uh, one of our hotels, and I was very tempted to say, you should look at CNG, you should look at uh, propane, you should do something that's going to reduce your emissions by 30% over gasoline, because that's good. Um, instead, what happened was we let them know that, you know, hey, we're, look, we're making a big purchase here. It's going to be something we're going to have for many years. You know, what sort of, um, what can we look at to reduce the emissions related to that vehicle? And the manager came up with, the one that is living it, breathing it, driving it every day, um, came up with the fact that our van was too big. We could go with a slightly smaller van. We could double our miles per gallon efficiency and have a 50% savings on our emissions compared to a 30% that I was uh, almost feeling compelled to uh, prescribe to them. And now, you know, that's not the um, end all and be all. It's not the perfect solution, but it's a great step. And it's one that worked with the timing of their business, with the needs they had, um, and them being, you know, the managers on site being part of that solution to reduce our emissions by 50% by getting something that doubled that fuel mileage, uh, you know, really gets them as, as, part of the, as part of the process, which is, it's, it's important. They're going to be the ones operating it and, and living with it. So the third key, uh, informing the vendors. And I really see this as the most effective. It requires the least amount of legwork from you in, you know, in the big picture of sustainable procurement, and I think of this as an army working on my behalf. They, uh, my vendors, my service providers have the information, they have products, they have services, they want to sell them to me, I just need to let them know what I want. And 
um, an obvious opportunity or an obvious way to get the biggest um, response from them is ask when you're buying. Um, asking at the point of purchase or including it in an RFQ um, really lets them know that this is going to be part of your decision-making process. And you know, not to say that you have no burden at this point. You, you know, your burden then becomes deciphering the uh, information, making sure that you're not just um, responding to greenwashing. You know, sort of having a, a decent um, BS meter to vet the different the different companies or the different products and, and understand who's who's giving you a fair assessment of their um, their product or service. And I included a, a screenshot here of a vendor letter we sent out. Very simple. Um, tried to leave it open-ended for vendors to reply and, and vendors of all different types and sorts, big and small. And I wanted to include I know this is a little small to, to read. It's more the um, the point that I wanted to make that um, you know sometimes from unexpected directions. This is a landscape uh, provider for our hotel in Norwood, and their response to our questionnaire was robust. It was here are all the things we're doing on your you know on site on your property, and also here are the additional things that we're doing in our own operation and. By engaging vendors, uh, by you know, by by bringing them into the fold, you get that opportunity to learn a little more about who you're doing business with, who your dollars are supporting, um, understanding that you know if their um, their goals are aligned with yours, and if their uh, sort of company ethic is aligned with yours. And so I was you know really encouraged by by this and. Um, you know, and, and I'm also realistic. We're we're a small company. Our buying power is is what it is, and so um, there are some vendors that respond aggressively to us sending out a questionnaire. There are others that don't respond at all, and you know that's maybe a, an added part of uh, what falls on you as a purchasing manager is knowing who to contact, who's going to respond, who cares about your needs, and uh, addressing it accordingly. And now the final point um, in terms of uh, creating a sustainable procurement policy um, and just getting it integrated into your business is, is timing. Being in the right place at the right time, um, having the information, having the uh, vendors that you can reach out to that you know have the products that uh, you're looking to source. Now, I mentioned you know, you're going to get your best response when a sale is on the line. But if you don't have this mentality as part of your overall uh, strategy, then not everyone's going to know to ask the question when that when that purchase is on the line. So it does really start sooner than when you're going to buy new cups or looking to renovate uh, your rooms. It's It's important that it gets incorporated into the normal processes. Uh, one example is our, you know, our capex schedule, our, our capital expenditures. Um, for many years, the operational department would put together a uh, a budget. It would be finalized in October, November, and sometime three months later, in the beginning of the new year, the eco team would weigh in on the things that they thought should go on. Um, from a capital expenditure standpoint, and that absolutely doesn't work. It needs to be all together um, at each large purchase, small purchase, that the mentality needs to be, what can we find that's better for us, better for our guests, better for our environment, um, exciting for our, our guests, exciting for our customers. That's got to be early and often. Um, I'm going to share a few examples of where timing worked well, or, or one one recent one for sure. But again, if you know, I get nothing else across. Buy differently and make your sustainable purchases an opportunity, not a restriction. Responsible luxury, responsible procurement. It does not mean sacrifice. And and I think the um, this next example is a, a a great indicator of that. 
Um, at the Lennox Hotel, I mentioned earlier, we did a, a full renovation of all our rooms, basically everything you see and touch in the, in the guest room. And I think in the past, our process probably would have been getting the design elements back and getting different carpet samples, and then the eco team or the sustainability folks running off into a corner and trying to find a green version of that carpet, which adds time, which adds often added money, um, and just made it separate and other than the normal uh, design and, and uh, selection process. With our renovation, this was probably more in line with, of what you do in a, uh, a lead um, lead type project, but we weren't going for lead. We asked our designer to come to the table with a, a sustainable um, fabric, a sustainable carpet, sustainable manufacturer for the furniture that was competitive in terms of quality and price with everything else she was going to bring us. And I've got to say, it worked out phenomenally. I was very pleased with it because it did not add an extra step. It was truly integrated into the, um, the process. We had all the decision makers getting to look at quality, price, availability, appearance, and sustainability all on an equal playing field and weigh in the different components. Um, this image that you're looking at, it's uh, a little truncated at the bottom, but um, I just wanted to show it to highlight that basically everything you touch and see in the room had, an, had a sustainable element woven into it, literally in some cases. And, you know, PVC free or uh, FSC certified wood, recycling the carpet and carpet using recycled content. There are, there are so many opportunities that are available now that can, can make this a, um, a project like this a, a showcase, not a, um, I don't know, not a, certainly not an afterthought and certainly not a uh, reduction from what it could have otherwise been. I think a lot of the, the decisions we made and the opportunities we took advantage of made this a better overall outcome. So I alluded to it at, uh, throughout, but you know the hurdles of, of trying to be too specific in our process, um, trying to be the ones that are there at every decision making point and, and um, you know, trying to, to micromanage the process did not work and making sustainability an extra step did not work. Weaving it in with the timing, informing our vendors and having products and services that we knew were available um, and cost competitive and quality competitive was important. Um, I put under one of the successes um, green power purchasing. So we, we offset 100% of our emissions related to energy. So uh, green electricity, carbon offsets for our um, all our natural gas use, and so just you know an inherently green or sustainable practice. And so, when deciding between different uh, vendors, different uh, providers of that, we actually took it a step further and and, and asked uh, each of them to help us communicate it. What could they do to help us not only make the you know make this specific purchase and this specific impact but how could we extend that and spread it uh, farther and wider and that became you know a, has developed into a great partnership with uh, uh, renewable choice energy and and beyond that they've they've taken it and run with it and and um, have become very proactive in terms of how they communicate and market and and how they've given us the tools to be able to do that uh, both internally and externally to guests and, and corporate business. Um, and the, the last item on the, on the list of successes, um, just from a standpoint of uh, the, the impact or the opportunity of sustainable purchasing, when the front lines get it, um, I feel like we're, we're doing a pretty good job. So I had, uh, one of our engineers that was changing a, a light bulb in a chandelier in a meeting room asked me, you know, Scott, why can't we get, you know, one of your lights? Why can't we put your lights in the chandelier? 
and what he was referring to the fact that I wander around trying out different LEDs and every every possible chance and uh, and we've converted to mostly LED and um, all of our guest rooms and, and expanding into the public spaces but what he was saying and, and what I was hearing was he understood the tangible benefit to him of this new technology I and mean, I don't know if he would sit down and be able to describe it but he knew intuitively that if you put that light up there, I don't need to be up on the ladder. I don't need to potentially damage this, this chandelier. I don't need to keep doing this every three days. And instead, I can be doing things. I could be in with a guest and helping them with their, their internet. Or I can be doing preventative maintenance on the guest rooms. I can be uh, painting in the lobby to make sure it's a crisp appearance for our guests. And so when he um, related to you know just a light bulb, basically, it uh, you know, it, it it heightened my my understanding of you know the opportunities internally, externally, um, and you know throughout the throughout our property and throughout our business. So I'm going to stop there, and um, you know, I, again, you know, going back to those four key elements of of defining your terms, defining your goals informing the army of vendors who want to work for your, your business and truly incorporating the timing into uh, the, the general wheels of, uh, of uh, the business that are in place, being in the right spot at the right time, that's where we found successes in uh, sustainable procurement. Well, Scott, that, that was excellent, and uh, it gives us a lot to think about. It certainly gives me a lot to think about. Um, Rob, uh, I think we're going to hold questions now till the end, but were there any questions? Yes, um, I, I, I can ask them, or we can wait. Yeah, wh wh why don't we hold them for the end and, um, and have Abby's talk now? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, George, if you could please turn the the uh, uh, authority over to Abby McAllister. Uh, this is a really exciting talk. Abby McAllister is the Saybrook Point Inn and Spa Green Team Leader. She is the Marina Manager at Saybrook Point and the first woman certified Marina Manager in Connecticut. She has worked with the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, the EPA, and marine industry leaders on the Connecticut Clean Marine Program. Uh, as you will see, the Saybrook Point Inn, a beautiful uh, facility uh, on the water in Connecticut, uh, has a, a really uh, uh, visionary, uh, comfortable, and wonderfully green hotel. Abby? Thank you, Dan. Um, the Saybrook Point Inn and Spa is a family-owned business. We're located at the mouth of the Connecticut River in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. It was purchased by the Tagliatella family about 27 years ago. And at that time, before green was something that people really did, Stephen Tagliatella mandated that environmental responsibility would be second only to guest comfort. He also required an average return of investment of three years or less on investments, which is kind of remarkable when you're looking at the big changes that he wanted made. We started with the things that most of you are probably doing. Property-wide initiatives include recycling, including in the guest rooms, and the in-room management system, as uh, our first presenter told us about, it's just amazing. LED lighting, water-saving shower heads and toilets, talent sheet program. Those are pretty much um, industry standards. We took it a little bit further and made all employees members of the green team. And in addition to Earth Day cleanups and planting the kitchen herb garden, all employees are encouraged to come up with new ideas to improve how we do business, sort of bringing that front line into the entire process. Uh, ideas we've gotten range from installing birdhouses for pest control, which actually works, to making sure the racks are full before they go in the dishwasher. One of our dishwashers came up with this. And it's really these small things add up to make a big difference. Uh, each department has area-specific initiatives, including reusable slippers in the spa and organic product line, 
farm to chef program in the restaurant, as well as elimination of all styrofoam to go containers. The kitchen has low water consumption dishwasher um, and a trash compactor to reduce the trash trucking cost, which is what you're looking at here. That's our trash compactor. We recycle grease to a biofuel program. We get paid for that grease. And the marina sells Valve Tech marine fuel, which is 10% more efficient than untreated fuel. And we recycle marine batteries and get paid for those cores. And we run a clean boater program. We were also the first clean marina certified by the DEP in Connecticut. Our housekeeping department utilizes certified green seal cleaning concentrates with a bulk dispenser, which means that we don't have to overuse of chemicals. We reuse the spray bottles that the, that the chemicals are mixed in, so we don't have waste there. We have a high-speed extract energy efficient washing machine, which incorporates a water reuse system. And one of my favorites is we collect these soap bars from the guest room for the Clean the World program, which is um, sends all the, the reprocesses the soap and other things from the guest room and sends it overseas to third world countries where they really need product like this that we were just throwing away in the past. Where we feel we've elevated the program is where the most substantial investments were made and where we see the biggest returns on investment. Refrigeration and air conditioning are done by a water source heat pump system. A 50 kilowatt natural gas cogeneration plant provides 20% of our peak load demand electricity. It also produces a half a million BTUs of heat, which is enough to heat all of our hot domestic hot water, our guest rooms in the winter, our saltwater swimming pools, including the outdoor pool even in the winter. Our boilers were converted to natural gas and are only for backup now. This meant that our heating oil storage tanks could come out and we replaced them with cisterns to collect rainwater for irrigation on the property. With all the systems we have implemented since 2008, including solar PV, cogeneration system, the fully networked in-room management system, LED lighting, et cetera, we have realized over a 40% decrease in energy uses, usage. Well, most properties spend 5 to 8% of operating revenues on energy. We spend slightly over 2%. That's quite a sizable savings. Our demand rate, which is how utilities determine our cost for electricity, has gone down 21%. Um, this has reduced uh, just since 2008 to 2013, we've made these savings. We expect to continue on and get to 50% usage dropped from 2008 rates by next year. PV solar panels provide another 7% of our electricity. We also have a 500 kilowatt biofuel capable generator. This allows us to participate in the ISO New England Demand Response Program. When it gets too hot in the summer and they start getting brownouts, they call us. We turn on our generator and we are able to backfeed into the grid electricity that we're providing. It also gives us a very low rate on purchased electricity. The generator ensures that the hotel is open and fully booked and the restaurant operating at capacity during any local power outages. We were hit by a couple of hurricanes and we're able to be a point of refuge for the community with that generator. We use something called a dolphin hydronic system to treat the cooling tower water with sound waves rather than chemicals. This is not only more energy efficient, far less maintenance is needed on the cooling system because the pipes are kept cleaner. Water is treated with a geomatrix soil air system. Our waste, we do not have city sewer, so all our wastewater needs to be treated on, on site. This geomatrix soil air system forces air into the leach field to decrease pathogens naturally. These are both local companies. We try to source locally wherever we can. Uh, water is then treated with UV light rather than chlorine. We've also installed two electric vehicle charging stations. These were paid for with grants. We offer this at no charge to our guests to try to encourage more use of electric vehicles. Three Stories is a new addition to the Saybrook Point property and will be the most energy efficient project yet. We're using an air source heat, heating and cooling system. 
it's very efficient and almost completely silent, addressing the universally common guest complaint that I'm sure everyone's heard, noisy air conditioning. Um, we have also joined the EPA Water Sense Initiative. We just started that, so we're looking for some, um, some great strides there this year. We offer all of our guests a green tour of the property. Um, this is our corporate sales team also incorporates this into some of the packages they offer for corporate groups. This has been very popular and helps us get the word out what we're doing. Um, I guess to wrap it up, no matter how, what size your property is or how diverse, there's always another environmental initiative that can protect the environment and save us money. Um, I'm going to put up my contact information, and I hope anybody who's ever in this area will come by and take our green tour. <laughs> that's all. Thank I you, highly Dan. recommend it. That's uh, remarkable. And uh, uh, thank you, Abby. Um, Rob Gilliman from the EPA, uh, we probably have a lot of questions. Um, for, uh, for both Scott and Abby, and uh, also if there are any other questions that we didn't get from Jim's presentation, uh, please fire away. Okay, well here's a question that actually both Scott and Abby can answer. It says, can you give examples of green amenities or initiatives that really excited guests and customers? Sure, I can um I'll start if, uh, if that's all right. So um, we installed a EV charging station uh, about two, maybe a little over two years ago. Um, and for the first, I don't know, year, I'd say, I, I got mocking looks from the valet team of wondering when someone was going to pull up and actually charge a car. Uh, but it has turned into... Um, Literally, a, if you build it, they will come. And now I'm getting, uh, you know, questions from the valet manager of, can we get a second one of these? You know, we're getting uh, Teslas left and right, and Chevy Volts, and we even internally um, purchased our own vehicles, knowing that all of a sudden that uh, the the fuel to run it was uh, a fraction of of the cost otherwise. Um, the other one that I'd highlight is uh, rooftop bees and the honey that comes from it, and incorporating that into uh, different um, different uh, breakfast and dinner items, a, a few specialty drinks. I think people really connect with. I don't think I'm saying anything new. People definitely connect with um, food and and the experience, and so that's been. Uh, a couple of them that have just gotten, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of great response. I can agree with Scott. This was our electric vehicle charging station. That's why we put in the second one. We had that much demand after the first year when people, again, sort of looked at it askance. Our other initiative that we get a great feedback from especially from the marina guests, is our herb garden. It, our herb garden is open not just to the uh, restaurant chefs to use in whatever they're preparing fresh that night, but we open up our herb garden to our boaters. And we have a lot of transient boaters coming through about 900 a season. And they love the fact that they can go and pick something fresh to make with their next meal that they're cooking on board, because it gets a little stale cooking on a boat after a while. And being able to access the fresh herbs is just, it's a high point. We get return guests just because of that. Wow, uh, very interesting. Rob, next question. The next question has to do with greenwashing and wondering if that is a large concern. Have vendors become sophisticated about greenwashing? Or have they just become also just more sophisticated about giving good green advice and talking about their products in a more clear way? Um, so greenwashing is, is definitely out there. And what, I, what I've been finding, I mean, I think it's, it's been evolving. Um, and in the US, for sure, we have a very skeptical audience. Uh, I mean, just there's advertisements about everything, and every car is the 
you know, rated number one in car and driver for something. So there's, you know, everybody's going to tell you that their product is the greenest for um, myriad reasons. So it's less about greenwashing, I guess, than than really determining what impacts are meaningful. And and what I mean by that is, um, you know, the difference between someone, you know, I ask about the uh, environmental benefits of the uh, to-go cups, and someone saying, "Well, they're they're recyclable." Okay, most plastic things are recyclable, um, so that doesn't really take a lot of effort on on their part, and it, it's not um, doing much more than describing what already is. Uh, I think what we're looking for is to go beyond that, and where are you sourcing your raw materials? Uh, how are you? You know where are your manufacturing plants? How are you shipping? Where you know how are you treating the people? If it's coffee, how are you dealing with the um, people that are, are are you know out in the fields day in and day out? And so you know it's I guess it's looking beyond just the superficial, which um, I think is ubiquitous now. I, um, you know every commercial I now hear the. You know, so and so's floor has a you know it's a a green tile, and and you know this car is the most eco-friendly uh, Ford F250 Dually on the market. You know, I mean, there is a you know there needs to be, especially on the you know the the purchasing side, the one making the the decision on where your dollars are going to go, uh, a heightened sophistication of not just taking everything at face value, but you know, digging deeper and, and comparing it. I mean, that's the value of, of having some competition and having new products. Uh, the the landscape is drastically different than five years ago, ten years ago, in terms of what's available at a competitive quality at a you know a competitive price. And so you know that sophistication of asking deeper questions or looking more than just, yes, you can recycle our plastic cup. Um, you know, that's that's the burden on, you know, on us, the purchaser now. Mm, thank you, Scott. Um, anybody else want to take a crack at that? Okay, Rob, uh, go on to the next question. All right, the next question has to do with providing tips or uh, giving examples of staff training um, for eliciting um, environmental feedback. So the, the question really is saying that asking uh, how can um, can you offer tips for uh, including staff feedback uh, and uh, is there any advice about staff training around green initiatives? Well, I could probably answer that. We have a staff at the high peak of the summer of about 153 people. As each person is hired, um, they will see our green presentation and sign off that they agree to be part of the green team. We have green team meetings every month, and they are attended not just by managers, but staff is encouraged to attend at least one green team meeting every three months um, so that they can give some input. And each manager is tasked with letting the people in their department know examples of what other team leaders have come up with for ideas and to say, what do you see that you could make a difference on? You don't have to go to the green team leader. You don't have to go to the manager. You could tell each other and they could you could email it to us or just put a note in a box with an idea. So anybody has time to come up with an idea and we have Earth Day is our big celebration when we invite all the staff and celebrate our accomplishments during the year. And it's sort of a thank you to everybody for what they've done, and it keeps it at the forefront. So I think I, on our property, pretty much everybody knows about it. We tend to get a little complacent. So every once in a while, we step up and say, OK, we're having another green team tour for staff to make sure that we haven't had new hires who are not aware of it. Once you get this culture started, though, it, it sort of takes on a life of its own, and the staff really becomes vested in this and proud of it. Uh, it's very inspirational. 
Um, Scott, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that um, briefly. I'm just going to, yeah, sure, piggyback on that. Uh, one thing that we've found a lot of uh, has gained a lot of traction um, is sort of a younger group of front desk agents coming through that's, that's been the department primarily that are studying things that are either specifically or, or you know, somewhat related to sustainability because um, there are a lot of students and and so grabbing one of them and making them part of a project and getting them excited has, you know, had the added benefit of them going back and talking about what they're doing and getting other people asking questions and um, just a, a level of engagement that was really started more from, hey, we need somebody that's interested to help out that has uh, spread through the department and, and through the, you know, the departments they interact with really well. Mm. Excellent. Um, Rob, next question. All right, the next question is for Jim. Uh, there's, uh, it, the question is, what is the typical payback periods for the systems that he installs? Well, well, range, I mean, the range of payback periods. Yeah, range of payback, range of payback period determines, uh, is determined by what type of option you choose. Usually if you have a standalone system it's going to be more in the uh, three and a half to four year range whereas you uh, tie in a network system and you have the capability of going into a deep setback which is you know, the second setback for being unoccupied, unrented, uh, you, you're typically in a two and a half to three and a half year period on the ROI. Now, now Jim, I assume that's before incentives. Uh, do most states uh, offer incentives for uh, guest room management systems? Uh, good question, and, and yes, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, it all depends on the state, but there are local utility incentives, rebates, uh, price per thermostat, uh, those type of things. Uh, also, um, there was a 179D tax credit that was given out last year. Um, I have to check back to see if that credit was applied for 2014. I'm not sure, but there are so there are also uh, tax credits uh, along with local utility rebates and state incentives to put some type of energy saving control systems in your in your property. Mm -hmm. Good. If I could sneak a quick question in for Abby, Abby, you said at the beginning that your owners wanted a three year ROI on all uh, capital projects. Did they always uh, d uh, demand that? Were all of the projects that you did, uh, that, that you accomplished, uh, have an ROI of, of um, under three years? No, that was what we were tasked with, but we, were, uh, we could go out of the box if it was a major project. The cogeneration system, which was about $250,000, um, has a 3.8 year return on investment but the savings are going to be so large that it's well worth going outside of that three-year target ROI. And I would like to say that our room management system was, I believe, a 2.6-year return on investment, and we did go with the entire um, networked um, package so that when our guests open the door in the room, the air conditioning goes off. It's it's helped our guests understand what energy usage is, and we've had no complaints at all. In fact, people are much happier because they have control of um, their thermostat, and the drift is much, much smaller. The, the temperature difference when they're in the room is much smaller because we can make up for that when they're out of the room. So, yeah, that was a shorter return on investment, but obviously the big, big ticket item we expect it, well, it was completed in 2011, but we're looking at a targeted 3.8 year return on investment. Mm -hmm. Good. Rob, next question. Okay, well, I'm going to be combining two. These are sort of the last two questions. Uh, the questions are, what future, incentive, uh, in, sorry, what future initiatives are being considered? And if you had all the money in the world, what would be the project that you would undertake? <laughs> So it's an open-ended one for whoever wants to take it. Sure, I'll take a, a stab at it. Um, but don't hold me to any of the, the things I say. Um, 
So in terms of the, the future initiatives, we've done a lot of work, and it sounds like in, in uh, similar fashion to Abby, you know, a lot of lighting, um, a lot of attention to HVAC, um, we've done refrigeration. Uh, water, although we've got, um, you know, low flow aerators on all our faucets and, you know, low flush toilets, water is still an increasing cost, water and sewer, across all our properties. Um, so really identifying big changes in how we use water or how we repurpose water. This may go to um, also lead into the answer of if we have unlimited money, but we're looking at ways to do uh, our laundry service with about 70% less water, um, still uh, vetting that and, and feeling out if it's the right project for us, but if it, if it is, it's 70% you know, less water in our our uh, washing of linens and terry would be huge. It would have a gigantic impact on the amount of water we use on site. And so maybe now bleeding into if I had unlimited funds um, and the regulatory wherewithal in Boston to get this done uh, would be better use of gray water. Um, all the you know all the sinks and showers potentially you know flushing toilets and um, you know just a, a wiser reuse of uh, of resources and you know and maybe carry that one step further to um, energy recovery from exhaust fans and you know we have existing buildings I mean as we build new that's going to be something incorporated into it but in existing and older buildings, um, reducting to capture the energy inherent in what we're, you know, exhausting from bathrooms and kitchens and public spaces, and being able to reuse that energy on air being introduced is uh, um, is something I'd love to be able to to do next. Hmm. Very good. And I would agree with I would agree with Scott on if the next big thing will be water recovery and water conservation. It's, it's, I think it's the next biggest issue and I think that's where if I had unlimited resources I would like to spend them, like, I would like to explore that avenue more, more fully and I'm very impressed by the idea of 70 percent savings on water in the laundry. That would be, I want to come up and see your what, your, <laughs> what you people are doing there. Um, that would be what we would want to do is, is water saving. Scott, could you comment on that? Uh, the 70 percent savings in the laundry, what, what kind of new system are you looking at that would create such a big savings? Uh, so it's um, called Xeros, X-E-R-O-S. Um, and again, don't hold me to this because we're still in, um, we're, we're very seriously and aggressively exploring an opportunity to get one of their units replaced two of our existing washers, but it's uh, polymer bead technology. So basically these little, uh, these little beads developed in England um, will get the agitation without, with 70% less water, they take up most of the volume that water would otherwise take up in a washer. They get the agitation, the chemicals are reduced by 50%. Uh, the water is all cold water, so, um, you know, save on natural gas as well, but um, that all is sort of inherent in in this new technology, which they're hoping to be a disruptive force in the laundry industry. I don't mean to do a commercial for them, but uh, I think hopefully then extending to the residential market. So um, yeah, we're we're looking at that, and and I don't know, very very um, eyes wide open now. I. Uh, I'm very sensitive to our properties. I've, I've done this to them in the past and need to be careful about making them guinea pigs, but it's a, <laughs> a great opportunity and, and it, you know, really well-based technology and, and company, but still very new. So it's that, you know, are you on the cutting edge or the bloody edge? And uh, we're trying to navigate that right now. Good. If I could ask a last question of Jim Shively. Jim, um, is there anything uh, very new and upcoming in terms of guest room management? Um, 
the, the newest technology is really the touch screen technology where it, it's more like a uh, iPhone. A lot of that technology is now coming out. Um, it, it has a lot more computer capabilities, you know, onboard uh, graphics, uh, uh, customizable de uh, designs within the screen itself. A lot of uh, uh, content can be um, uh, pushed to the, to the screens uh, showing guests, uh, you know, a, an advertisement of what's going on in the hotel. Uh, that is also tied back into the guest content onto the televisions. You have uh, table uh, top uh, tablets. Uh, you got the guest content that can be applied. Uh, so the guest content uh, guest can bring their own um, uh, content and devices in and tie that back into controlling lights and thermostats. And I mean, there's there's all kind of new technology that's coming out uh, here in the future. Which is kind oh, of very, exciting. very interesting. Well, I would like to thank the audience for attending. I'd like to thank very much our speakers, Scott Hops, Abby McAllister, and Jim Shively. I also want to thank uh, Rob Gilliman from the EPA and George Burgos from the EPA um, for uh, 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 for <clears throat> uh, gr uh, giving this this grant and to giving us this opportunity, and for George being the webmaster. So thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you in one week uh, at the session five of this Green Hotel webinar series.